Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness, the podcast dedicated to helping physicians in Michigan turn their professional success into financial success while enjoying life along the way. And now, here are your hosts, Andrew Mushbaugh and Trent DeBruin. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness. This is Trent DeBruin, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Andrew Mushbaugh. And today, we're going to talk about managing your cash. And no, don't worry, this doesn't have to do with budgeting, so we won't put you through that. But this is a topic that's relevant for physicians of all ages, from early career through retirement. So we want to spend some time breaking it down and sharing our perspective on how to think through it. So our plan is to go through the full process from figuring out how much cash to keep on hand to optimizing the way you hold that cash from a financial perspective. And Andrew, I know for you, cash management always starts with having enough on hand to pay your fantasy football dues, right? Exactly. That's step one. I have to make sure we have enough on hand for that $100 buy-in every year. So now that we're past that into the season, I guess we can move on to the next step, right? Exactly. And hopefully I'll win and get more than that $100 buy-in back. Yeah, we'll have to have an update on that later in the season. So just to start out, we want to provide a quick definition of what we mean when we're talking about cash. In this context, we're not talking about physical cash like dollar bills, although we do have a client who likes to joke about squirreling away actual cash in different places around the house for a rainy day. So I guess that's possible. But what we're talking about here is money that's being kept in the bank, whether that's in a savings account or a checking account. In other words, money that's being held there rather than actively being used for a specific purpose at a particular time. And big picture, cash plays an important role in your financial life and financial plan. So while it might seem passive or inefficient to have cash just sitting there not being used for anything, as you'll see, it can play a valuable role for you. So that's an initial overview, and now we'll dive into it by tackling the first question, and typically the biggest question, which is, how much cash should you keep on hand? Yes. With most things in financial planning, we like to follow a process when breaking this down and trying to figure out what number is right for you. And there isn't one right answer here on how much cash to keep in an emergency fund, but it's really important to be intentional about this decision. And an emergency fund is really just an extra cushion of money that's available to use if needed, but isn't currently earmarked for anything specific. Or as the name implies, a fund available for an emergency. And yes, we still aren't winning any creativity awards here for the names. And the reason an emergency fund is important is because it provides extra cushion with your finances and helps prevent you from being in a situation where you need the money for something, but don't currently have it available. So effectively, it prevents you from unnecessarily having to borrow money, take on credit card debt, or sell from your investments to cover an unforeseen expense. And deciding on the emergency fund is like Goldilocks, where you want to find that right balance, avoiding too much cash sitting in an account where it could be put to better use but also not having enough in cash that there is any stress over the near term of cash flow and meeting your expenses. Life is unpredictable and you never know when your car might break down, you need a home repair, or you have an expensive healthcare bill. These are just a couple examples, but you can probably think of many more similar large one-off expenses that could come into play, but are also tough to see or know in advance. Another situation where an emergency fund can come into play is in the event of one or both of the spouses losing a job or having a disability. In this scenario, your household income will be temporarily reduced, because someone suddenly either can't work or no longer has a job bringing in an income. If this happens, you'll still have your monthly expenses you need to cover, regardless of what's happened with your income. In the case of disability, depending on the nature of your disability insurance, there may be an initial waiting period, also known as an elimination period, where your insurance doesn't start paying out the money to you until after a certain amount of time, such as 90 days. Having an emergency fund allows you to cover these costs as they materialize without any stress and without scrambling to come up with the money somehow. It's essentially a way to be more intentional and proactive when managing your finances and setting things up on the front end in order to then minimize potential stress along the way. In other words, the emergency fund is more or less like insurance or protection from these unforeseen expenses. As you can see, there are many reasons for having an emergency fund, and this is why we view it as the first step of cash management. And when looking at this first step of deciding on an emergency fund, there are general rules of thumb out there, like having three to six months of living expenses. However, that's just the starting point, and you want to factor in anything unique to your financial situation or preferences in general. There is a spectrum here where you have someone who wants to optimize every last dollar and keep the bare minimum they need in cash versus those that have $100,000 plus sitting there because it helps them feel better and not worry about their expenses or investments. Exactly. Understanding the rationale for having an emergency fund is one thing, but the next question is how much to keep in an emergency fund. And here, there are really two different parts to consider, the quantitative or numbers and the qualitative. In terms of purely the numbers, like Andrew mentioned, the general rule of thumb is to have an emergency fund equal to three to six months of living expenses, although there's some nuance here. If you think about the income disruption and protection aspect of an emergency fund, it's obvious that there's more risk to household income disruption if the household relies on only one income rather than on two. For example, Andrew's wife Jenny works outside the home and has an income from that, while my wife Jen is a stay-at-home mom. So their household's a dual-income household, while ours is a single-income household. 
If your household relies on a single income, it makes sense to have more months of living expenses in your emergency fund to provide extra cushion or protection. So perhaps rather than keeping three months of living expenses, you choose to have six instead. So that's a bit on the quantitative side. And the idea here is to have enough in your emergency fund that you'd be able to ride out any periods of income disruption or cover any unexpected lumpier expenses if they happen to occur. But the other aspect is the qualitative side and taking into account your own personality and preferences. And the biggest point here is that different people feel differently about money. Some people feel less stress and are able to sleep better at night knowing they have a bigger amount of cash that's available if needed, while others are totally fine keeping the bare minimum in cash and putting anything extra to better use. For the first group, money is often security and having more on hand feels better. While for the second group, the stress can instead come from feeling like they have too much in cash and aren't optimizing things as opposed to not having enough. So different people feel differently and Andrew and I are even a bit different in this regard where I prefer to keep more cash on hand because it feels better to me and I place a lot of value on that. Whereas Andrew's more comfortable keeping less in cash. And since people all have their own unique preferences of how much to keep on hand, more often than not, couples tend to feel differently from one another when it comes to this as well. And it's quite common to see a situation where one person wants to have more in cash while the other wants less. As with most things in personal finance, when there are situations like these, typically the best approach is some sort of compromise and meeting in the middle, where you have enough in cash to give peace of mind to the one person, but not too much where the second person feels like they aren't optimizing things. One thing we do want to emphasize is that peace of mind and reduced stress are extremely valuable, even if you can't put a specific dollar value on them. So in the context of an emergency fund, it's really important to take these factors into account. You don't always need to do the quote-unquote financially optimal thing in every area of managing your finances at all times. And if having more in cash is going to allow you to sleep better at night and not stress about things as much day to day, it's worth considering that even if it means potentially missing out on better returns on the money. So tying it all together, when it comes to figuring out the right amount for your emergency fund, you want to consider both the quantitative side, generally three to six months worth of living expenses, depending on your household's employment situation, as well as the qualitative side how you and your spouse or partner feel about money. And it's probably obvious, but because of this, the actual amount for each person's emergency fund is going to be different. And it's better to approach it using this process rather than using some general rule of thumb in terms of dollar amount, because the actual amount will vary depending on things like your lifestyle and your feelings toward money. So are you saying that Bill Gates' emergency fund is bigger than yours? Well, I don't have the specific numbers to compare, but yeah, I do think there's a chance. Oh yeah, just a really small chance, I'm sure. <laughs> So that covers step one of the process to follow when figuring out how much money to keep in cash. And stepping back, while you want to put some thought into how much you have in an emergency fund, it's helpful to remember this isn't an exact science. Oftentimes, a round number of $25,000 or $30,000 helps to avoid overthinking how much to have. After you have your emergency fund figured out, then you can move on to step two, which is earmarking any money that you'll need for short-term goals. And when we talk about short-term goals, we're talking about anything within the next one or two years. It may be a down payment for a house, renovations to your existing house, or buying a different car within the next couple of years. Basically, any larger one-off uses of cash that you wouldn't be able to cover from your normal month-to-month cash flow. And going back to the emergency fund discussion, step one was about covering lumpier uses of the cash that aren't visible, whereas step two is looking at expenses that are visible and that you know will be coming sometime soon, even if you don't know the exact timing of when that will be. And to provide some bigger picture context, when you think about how much money you should keep in cash, it's presumably because you're planning to do something with the additional cash, and often that's investing it. However, as we've mentioned several times in the podcast, while you invest in the stock and bond markets with the expectation of earning a higher return on your money than keeping it in the bank, those higher returns aren't guaranteed, especially over shorter periods of time. The stock market has historically provided an average annual return of around 10%, but there are points when it's been down 20, 30, or 40% or even more. And the shorter the time period you're looking at, the less certain the stock market returns are. So if you know you'll need the money for one of your goals or uses within the next couple of years, it's better to simply keep that money in cash rather than taking the risk of investing it. Yes, you won't get much, if any, return on it, and the stock market goes up more often than it goes down, so there's a chance you'll miss out on a higher return if you had invested it, but you'll also avoid the risk of bad timing or a bad period in the stock market and having the money be worth less when you actually need it. This is the rationale for earmarking any money needed for short-term goals and simply keeping it in cash rather than trying to invest it. You minimize the downside risks, which can allow you to take risk elsewhere to earn a higher return, like investing for retirement or other longer-term goals. From a practical standpoint, it's a simple process of looking at what you want to do over the next couple of years and thinking about the various things that you'll need larger amounts of money for. Then add all those items up to come up with the total amount that you'll need and earmark that money by setting aside the amount of cash to go along with your emergency fund. After having done that, between your emergency fund and the additional money for near-term goals, 
you'll have an amount of cash that will give you a cushion and peace of mind to navigate any uncertain or unpredictable events, while also providing the certainty that you'll be able to cover larger, visible expenses and uses of cash in the near term. So that covers the question of figuring out how much cash to keep on hand. The second big question, which we'll now walk through, is what to do with the cash that you do keep on hand. So when you keep cash in the bank, the bank pays you interest on your money. And the reason the bank's willing to do that is because it takes the money it's paying interest on, then turns around and lends it out to someone else at a higher interest rate. So it makes money on the spread between what it pays you and what it lends the money at. And generally speaking, the interest rate the bank pays you is a function of the overall economy and the level of interest rates for the economy as a whole. Right now, interest rates are near historically low levels. And while this is good for anyone borrowing money, such as a mortgage, it's not great for anyone keeping money in the bank. So if you look at the interest rates for most savings and checking accounts being offered by the big banks, it's basically only slightly above 0%. So most banks are paying very little in the way of interest, but there are some options for finding a better rate if you look for them. One of these options is that certain banks offer teaser rates for certain savings accounts, where they'll pay you a higher interest rate on up to a certain amount of money. This is an opportunity to earn more interest, but the limits in terms of how much of your money is able to earn that higher rate tend to be low, so it's not always ideal. Another approach, and the one that Andrew and I both use for our own cash, is opening up a high-yield online savings account. There are many different options here, but two of the most common ones are Ally Bank and Marcus by Goldman Sachs. And the way these online banks work is that because they don't have physical branch and ATM networks like the traditional banks have, they don't have the costs associated with them. And because they have lower costs, they're able to turn around and share some of that with their customers in the form of higher interest rates. Most of these online banks have the same deposit insurance as traditional banks, known as FDIC insurance, which covers balances up to $250,000 per depositor per account. So they have the same consumer protection that regular banks have. They also tend to have pretty good customer service and good apps. So they're generally easy to use in terms of initial account opening and ongoing management. And it's easy to transfer money back and forth to and from other banks, such as if you have your checking account at a traditional bank and want to then open a high-yield online savings account to earn more interest on your savings, which is what Andrew and I do. We have our regular checking accounts at Chase, but our savings accounts at Ally. So this is our preferred approach for parking cash that we know we're going to be keeping on the sidelines. And it's kind of ironic that these are called high-yield savings accounts because even the interest rates for the best ones are only around 0.5% right now. But it's better than nothing and much better than what most traditional banks are offering. And just stepping back a bit, when we're looking at the cash we're keeping on hand for either an emergency fund or short-term goals, our goal with it is stability rather than earning a rate of return. And when it comes to investing, risk and reward tend to be correlated, where if you want a higher return, it comes with higher risk. So yes, you could invest the cash in a diversified bond fund, which would pay a higher interest rate. But unlike a savings account, the price of the bond fund can fluctuate and there are periods of time that the price can decline. So the value isn't guaranteed. There are also other guaranteed options for investing cash, such as purchasing a CD or a certificate of deposit. And in many times in the past, CD rates have been higher than savings account rates. But right now, given how low interest rates are, the rates offered on CDs are pretty similar to those offered on high yield savings accounts. Most CDs also have some type of lockup period where you're committing to hold your money with them for a certain period of time, say one year or 18 months. And if you withdraw your money before then, there are penalties in terms of lost interest. So knowing the nature of an emergency fund, as well as the fact that the exact timing of near-term goals and uses of cash can't always be predicted, it's nice to have the flexibility of a high-yield savings account where you can move money in and out at any time without penalty or without any type of restriction while still earning interest on it. And interest rates do fluctuate over time. And in the future, it's certainly possible that we'll be in a situation where there's a better option for parking cash than a high-yield savings account. But for now, that's the best option. And it's nice to at least be able to earn something on the cash that's just sitting there rather than nothing. So that's our overall perspective on managing cash. And hopefully that's helpful for everyone in terms of a process to follow for figuring out how much cash to keep on hand, but also what to do with it. I know we sound like a broken record, but this is one of the many areas of personal finance where there isn't necessarily one black and white right answer for everyone. But our goal here is to provide you with a framework for at least figuring out what that right answer is for you personally. And just to give a quick recap of what we covered. So number one, the first step of figuring out how much cash to keep on hand is figuring out how much to keep in an emergency fund. The financial rule of thumb is three to six months worth of living expenses, but you also want to take into account your household's income situation. Single income households would want more cushion than dual income households. And also your views and your spouse's or partner's views toward money and what feels comfortable for you. Number two, after deciding on the amount for your emergency fund, 
The next step is to think about the various uses of money you'll have within the next couple of years for different goals, such as a home purchase, renovations, etc. Add that to your emergency fund and you'll have the total amount of money to keep in cash for your situation. And number three, while there aren't a lot of great options right now in terms of earning a rate of return on cash, consider looking at an online savings account to get a much better interest rate than what most traditional banks are offering, while also having flexibility and certainty of knowing what the money will be worth when you actually need it. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us for another episode of the show. If you have thoughts to share or questions you'd like to have answered, you're always welcome to email us at info at mdwmllc.com. You can also find the show notes and any links for this episode at mdwmllc.com slash podcast. Take care, everyone, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to make smart financial decisions? Check out the resources section of MD Wealth Management's website at mdwmllc.com, where you'll find additional knowledge and insight for Michigan physicians, including a blog, ebook, and one-page guides. While there, you can also schedule a 15-minute conversation with Andrew and Trent to learn more about what it means to work with the firm and how they serve physicians. If you've enjoyed the content, please leave a review on iTunes and share with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for listening. Andrew Mushba and Trent DeBruin are certified financial planners, principals, and co-founders of MD Wealth Management, a registered investment advisory firm in the state of Michigan. All opinions shared in the show are for general information and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future returns. Please consult with your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before making any decisions. 